Good morning. It's good to have you all here with us this morning. We have a few people who are away so we can pray for them. Uh, Malcolm and Gail are on their way to the island. Or let me tell you the truth. They're gone to the peninsula of PEI. Right? The only island is Cape Breton. Right? Because PEI has that bridge and now it's a fixed link. And Cape Breton, their bridge opens. So we're the only island. So when you hear the island, it's Cape Breton, the peninsula of PEI. So anyway, they're over in PEI. We're on their way for CMA ministry today. Um, Pastor Morris and Gail are down at uh, Country Calvary uh, ministering to them today. So you can pray for them as well. And we have a few people who are away and a few who aren't feeling well. So it's good to have you guys with us. Um, just a few announcements before we continue on in our service. Tonight at six o'clock, we'll be meeting here in our facility and also on Facebook Live as we continue through Luke chapter 11. Tuesday at noon is our 15 minutes in the word and that's on Facebook Live. And we are starting Psalm eight. Uh, Wednesday at 7 p.m. is our prayer meeting and Bible study here at our facility. Thursday at 6.30, there'll be a deacons meeting here in our facility. And then Sunday, 9.45, our adult Sunday school, and then our morning service. Um, you see here, let's continue to pray for our missionaries. There's folks who have uh, different health problems going on. Uh, continue to pray for Kevin. Kevin is still in the ICU in Camelton. Uh, they took him off the respirator. Um, all the tubes and everything are, are out, so I don't know what is going on other than that. So continue to pray for Kevin. And, um, you know, and uh, that God would just work in his life and guide the doctors and nurses and stuff to help him. Uh, let's remember the Christians and the nation of Afghanistan. Um, our missions conference, we had a great time last weekend, did we not? We had a great time with Ed and Teresa Seeley, and uh, we were challenged. We were uh, uplifted. And now that we are challenged, let's uh, continue to pray that, that we will will accept that challenge and continue on reaching people for Christ. Um, our family and friends at the Drew continue to pray for the Drew. As you know, uh, they are in lockdown right now because there's cases of COVID there. Um, 10, I believe, right now, seven residents and three staff members, so pray for them and um, others that are dealing with COVID-19. And of course, um, pray for the unsaved. We all have unsaved friends and family. Um, so let's pray that God would, would work in their hearts. Uh, I believe that's all the announcements and such. So I'm going to ask you to stand as we sing 572, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. 572. is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of the Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rest. 
rapture now bursts on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me for our scripture reading this morning. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 down to 13. Hebrews chapter 4, starting at verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, they, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into the rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him which with whom we have to do. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, again, we do thank you. We thank you for this beautiful day that you have given to us. This indeed is a day that the Lord has made, and because of that, we will rejoice in it. Thank you for allowing us to be here in your house this morning with your people. What a joy it is to gather together, to fellowship, to encourage each other, to worship you together. So, Father, just bless this time that we have this morning as we center and focus our thoughts around you. You alone are worthy of our praise and our adoration. And, Lord, we thank you for being such an awesome God. You are almighty God. You're all-knowing. You're all-present. You are faithful you are just, you are holy, you are loving, you are forgiving. You are our peace and our joy. And the list goes on, Father, of who you are. 
And because of who you are, we stand in awe of you. So, Father, we thank you for being here with us this morning. We think of those who couldn't be with us today. Lord, we already mentioned some are away ministering in different places, and we praise you for that. This bless them as they serve you today. Lord, we think of those who couldn't be with us because they are away on vacation or other things. Lord, we just pray for them, that you would show yourself to them in a mighty way. We pray for those today who are home because they are, are ill. Um, Lord, just, just touch their bodies, relieve the illness that they have, take it from them, Father. We pray for our brother William, who is not feeling well um, because he had his second shot the other day, Lord. Just restore him to his, his health so he can be back with us, Lord. Um, we think of our dear friends and family at the Drew. Um, Lord, just, just protect those that are there. Um, those that have COVID-19, Father, we just pray that, that they would be relieved of that quickly and that there would be no one else that would be positive for that virus, Father. Um, put a hedge of protection around those folks and the employees that are there. And Father, we just, just thank you again for your goodness that you are in control of everything. And because you are in control, we can trust you. So Father, help us to do that more and more each day, to trust you and no one else but God alone. So Father, just bless this time that we have this morning. Speak to our hearts in a powerful way, Lord. And may we leave this place rejoicing because we were here with each other and we were in your presence here. So Father, just, just accept our praise and our honor. And may you be glorified today in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you sit down, let's greet one another. Remember, if you see a hugger or a shaker coming your way, stick out your elbow and they will just tap you on the elbow um, and just say hi to each other. Number 580, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I learned to trust in God. <laughs> things aren't we whatever we're going through we've learned to trust in Jesus we've learned to trust in God 
and we learn to depend upon his word, right? Even through COVID, you know, we've learned to trust in Jesus more. We learned to trust in God more, and we learn to depend upon his word because his word tells us that he is in control. His word tells us that, hey, you can trust me. His word tells us, hey, you can cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. Anybody here heavy laden? Anybody here need rest? He says, come and I will give you these things. And through every situation in life, we've learned to trust him. And I trust in these last several months that we've learned to trust him more and more and more because he's been with us through it all. And he's going to be continuing to go with us through the rest of it. And he's going to continue to be with us until we go home. And we can trust that. Let's just pray and give thanks for the tithes and offerings that have been coming in over the last little while so the work of Salem can continue on. Father in heaven, again, we do thank you and praise you for your goodness to us. And Lord, we thank you that you are with us through it all. And we thank you for your faithfulness. Your word tells us great is your faithfulness. And you have proved that over and over and over again for us here at Salem as a, a church body and also individually. So we thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for the faithfulness of your people. Lord, that even through this pandemic, as you have blessed us, folks have been given faithfully to the work here at Salem, and we are so thankful for that. So, Father, this morning we ask that you bless each gift that is given, that you bless each person that is here, and that we as your church would be faithful stewards with these gifts, and we would use them wisely and not waste any of them. So, Father, again, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 571, trust and obey. That's the only way to be happy in Jesus, yes? Is to trust and obey. So we're going to sing just the first three verses of trust and obey, and then we'll do the last two verses after um, we look into God's word. So let's stand and sing 571, trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey burden we bear not a sorrow we share but our toil he does richly repay not a grief nor not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, 
All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at the passage of Scripture that we uh, read this morning, Hebrews chapter 4. And if you recall, last time we were together, we were looking at the topic of listen up, listen up, folks. And we are looking at things that we need to to listen to or things that we need to, to take heed to. And it's important that we, we listen up. It's important that we take heed and recognize the spiritual dangers that exist when one starts to drift or neglect God's word and when one starts to doubt God's word. Because there are people, there are believers that are drifting from God's word. Isn't that true? They're neglecting God's word. And I trust that it's none of us here are neglecting God's word. But that can happen so easy, can't it? It can happen so easy. You know, Monday morning hits and we got to get up. It's time to go to work or it's time to go to school. And we're like, I don't want to get out of bed today. But you know, you have to. And what do we do? We jump out of bed. We get ready. Um, people that drink that coffee stuff, they get their coffee because they can't function without it. And then they might read the newspaper or they might turn on the TV and watch the news or watch something else while they're having breakfast. And then out the door they go. They neglect it. God's word that morning because they were in a rush. I've done this before, and maybe you've done this before too. You get up and you're in a rush. I'll read it later at dinner time or whenever. And then you're laying in bed that night and it's like, oh, I didn't read God's word today. First thing tomorrow. And then tomorrow is a rerun of the day before. Then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, I didn't read my Bible in three days. I didn't read my Bible in four days. We start to drift from God's word. And the writer of this book is saying, be careful, take heed, listen up. Don't drift from God's word. Because what happens when we drift, then we start to doubt then we start to not trust the word as we should. And in the, the book of Hebrews, the writer is giving five different warnings. And this is the second one. Don't doubt God's word because it will harden your hearts. So we need to be very careful. So we looked at the provocation or the rebellion of Israel through all this. So we're going to move on. Um, to chapter 4, but before we do, there's just two more thoughts from, from chapter 3. You know, listen up, take heed, do this. Avoid these spiritual dangers. But friends, look at chapter 3, verse 13. It's important that we encourage one another, is it not? It's important that you and I encourage one another to be faithful in the Lord. Listen to what it says. But exhort one another monthly, daily. Exhort one another daily why it is called today. And if you recall, when we looked at that word today, that means now. Exhort one another now to be faithful in the Lord, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. <coughs> so we need to encourage one another to be faithful in the Lord daily. And when I get up here and start spewing at the mouth, it's not just for the fun of it. It's to encourage us, not just you, but to encourage myself 
to be faithful in the things of the Lord. Sometimes I find when I'm in my office and I'm putting a sermon together, quite often I'm preaching to myself. And then I come and preach it to you guys. And quite often on Thursday morning, I get up here and I preach it to myself. Because often I need it as well as anybody else to encourage each other in the faith. We need to be doing that. From reading this section and other sections in the book of Hebrews, we get the idea that some Christians were getting careless when it comes to encouraging one another. Some Christians were getting careless in their fellowship with one another. Some Christians were getting careless in the fellowship with one another in the local assembly. Hebrews chapter 10, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time here. We'll spend more time when we get to Hebrews chapter 10. But Hebrews chapter 10, listen to what it says in verse 23 to 25. It says this, Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another. Let us encourage one another. Let us be there for one another. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Anybody provoke you lately? Come on, be honest. <laughs> it's easy to get provoked, isn't it? Maybe sometimes when I'm preaching up here, I'm provoking you. I don't like what he said today. Who does he think he is to say that to me? Let's remember, folks, it's not me saying anything. We're looking at God's word. And if we're offended or feel like our toes were tramped on, that's God. It's easy to provoke someone. Just go on Facebook and make one statement. And you'll see people's reactions. But we're to provoke one another. What does it say? Onto love and good works. So we need to be pushing each other to love and to good works. Look what verse 25 says, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Isn't that true? Paul wrote that, or the writer of Hebrews wrote that. <laughs> Might have been Paul. But the writer wrote, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. If this was written today, I think it would say, as the manner of a lot are. Don't forsake the assembly together. We need to gather together, folks, so that we can encourage each other in love and good works, so that we can encourage each other in being faithful to the Lord. We need to be together, don't we? We need to be together. I praise God that during COVID-19, we were able to do online. We have reached a lot of people from different areas online, and we still are. We're continuing on with it. But my fear is that people are going to get so comfortable watching it at home in their lazy boy chair with their coffee that I don't need to go there. Yes, we need to be here. How do I fellowship with someone when I'm home by myself in my living room? How do I provoke or encourage someone to love and good works when I'm not around anybody? 
So we need to be together. We need to be together because we belong together and we need each other, don't we? We need each other. I need you. And I realize that more and more during COVID. I need you people. Because I hate it. Hate it. Preaching Sunday morning to myself. Because that happened for what, 15 weeks? Nobody in the building but me and Paul. I enjoyed preaching to Paul. But it was tough. And you guys even noticed it, and I even said it. Even when I preach and nobody's here, I'm still looking around as if you're here. But we need each other. We belong together. Just think of Moses and Caleb and Joshua. They tried to encourage the nation of Israel, didn't they? They tried, but the nation refused to enter into Canaan. The people just wouldn't listen. They refused. So folks, we need to encourage one another. We need to be together in order to do that. The emphasis of Hebrews is also that true believers have eternal salvation because we are trusting in a living Savior who constantly is interceding in our behalf. Isn't that great news? Our salvation is sure because we can trust Jesus who is interceding on our behalf. But the writer here is careful to point out that this confidence, knowing that our salvation is eternal, is not an excuse to sin. It's not an excuse to sin. Because when we do sin and we don't confess sin, what happens? God disciplines us. God chastens those whom he loves, we see in Hebrews chapter 12. We don't lose our salvation, but God disciplines his children. And folks, we need to remember that Canaan is not a picture of heaven, but of the believer's present spiritual inheritance in Christ. Believers who doubt God's word and rebel against God. Do they lose heaven? Not if they're genuinely saved, but they miss out on the blessings that he wants to give us. They miss out on the fellowship that God wants to have with us. They miss out on their inheritance today and they must suffer the chastening of the Lord. So let's encourage each other to be faithful to the Lord. In chapter 4, this is a continuation of the warning that he is giving in chapter 3 about not doubting God's word. We come to the first let us. Let us. Not saying let us, but let us. This phrase is used several times in the book of Hebrews, and we will go through each of them as we go from verse to verse. But the writer here is urging the Hebrew believers to go on with the Lord. He's constantly challenging them. And that's a good challenge for all of us, isn't it? I challenge you today to keep on going with and for the Lord. I challenge us today to be faithful to the Lord. I challenge us today to provoke or encourage each other to love and good works. There's a whole lot of the let us passages here. But the first one, look at verse 1. Let us therefore fear. 
Let us therefore fear. Stop it, pastor. You're contradicting yourself. Didn't you tell us during all of COVID not to fear? Didn't you tell us trust God? So you're contradicting yourself when you're telling us let us fear. Doesn't the Bible tell us, Pastor, in Romans 8, verse 15, that you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father? Doesn't the Bible say in 2 Timothy 1, 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind? Isn't there a fear not for every day of the year in the Bible? And now you're telling us to fear? Remember, it's not me telling us to fear. It's God. Let us therefore fear. It's all true. God has not given us a spirit of fear. That's true, yes. It's true. God says over and over, fear not. But it's also true that there are times when fear is a good thing. When fear is a good thing. I am afraid of bears. And I hope you all are. If I see a bear walking down Main Street, I'm not just giving the bear the right-hand side of the road. I'm giving the bear the whole road. Right? I'm getting out of there. So there are things that you and I would do well to fear. Let us therefore fear. I wish that there were more Christians, more believers today, who feared or were concerned about their ignorance to God's word. I wish there was more people that feared that. You know, people that say, oh, my ignorance to God's word, I am afraid of that. I am afraid to disappoint God when I sin. I, I wish there was more believers that would say the same thing. I am afraid to disobey God when I sin. That, that way, when I do, I confess it immediately. There are few believers who fear or who are afraid of their ignorance to the scriptures. So when the writer of this book, and he says to us, therefore, fear, he's speaking of a good fear. When our kids were growing up, when we were living in Quebec, I think Brittany was seven, Tim was five when we moved to Quebec, somewhere around there. And we lived on Route 132. And that was the main highway. So when our kids had to go to the bus, they had to cross the highway to get to the bus stop. So we always told our kids, don't go on the street. Don't play on the street. We wanted them to have a fear of the street. That's a good fear, isn't it? It was a good fear. We didn't want anything to happen to them. So it's a good fear. Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. That verse tells us this is the kind of fear that you and I need to have. We need to have the fear of the Lord. And we don't disappoint him. And for the believer, the fear of the Lord is we have that reverence, we have that respect, 
We are in awe of who God is. Are we in awe of who God is this morning? I hope we can say, yes, we are. We're in awe. We're beyond awe. May we never lose the wonder of it all. May we never lose the wonder of prayer. We're praying to God Almighty. May we never lose our thirst for God's word and godly things. Fear can be a good thing. The fear that is being talked about here in verse 1 is for a purpose. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. The rest of this passage talks about rest, which we've already talked about a few weeks ago. And there are several kinds of rest, aren't there? You remember there was creation rest. There was the Sabbath rest. There's the Canaan rest. There's a future rest. He's saying to believers, be afraid or fear because you don't want to miss out on this. You don't want to miss out on the rest that God has for you. So don't doubt God's word. Trust him. Trust him because you don't want to miss out on this. And I ask myself, how many believers today are missing out on this? How many believers today are missing out? Have you entered into rest? Do you know? Do you know what it is to really trust Christ and rest in him? And I trust we can say, yes, I've trusted in him. He's my Lord and Savior, and I'm resting in him. What a peaceful place to be. Resting in him. Does that mean we'll never have a problem again in life? No. But we can rest in him because he's with us through it all. Isn't he? He's with us through everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He is there. Trust in him. Rest in him. Verse 2 says, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Here is the rest of salvation. The rest of trusting Christ as Savior. They heard the gospel. Some of these people heard the gospel, but they did not believe it. Therefore, they have no rest. Sound like today? There are countless people who have heard the gospel message and have not believed. What does the Bible say about that? They are without hope. They are hopeless. Helpless. They've heard the gospel but refused to believe it. Their life is anything but in rest. Believers today, we may enter and enjoy our spiritual inheritance in Christ. We must be careful. We must be careful lest we fail to believe God's word. We need to be careful. For it is only God's word mixed with faith, is what this verse is saying, that it accomplishes its purposes. We hear God's word 
and we receive it by faith. Yes. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And the argument in this section that we are talking about, verse 1 to verse 13, we're dealing with is given in several different ways concerning rest. God finished his work and rested. Yes? That's what Genesis chapter 2 tells us. He did not rest because he was weary. He did not rest because he was tired and needed a break. He rested because the work was finished. And it was very good. So his rest has been available ever since. The Jewish folks, they failed to enter into their rest. And many years later in Psalm 95, which we looked at already, God said that that rest is still available. Rest is still available. In Psalm 95, it says these words, today, which means now, now, rest is still available. Now. That means Joshua did not lead Israel into true rest because a rest still remains. And that goes along with the theme we've been looking at all these months in Hebrews, that Jesus is better than anyone and anyone, anyone and anything. And in this section, we're dealing with how Jesus is better than Moses in the rest that he gives. And here he is better or superior to Joshua than the rest that Joshua was leading the people into. Jesus' rest is better. It's better. The Canaan rest for Israel was a picture of the spiritual rest that we find in Christ when we surrender to him. And we must do that. We must surrender to him. When we come to Christ, we find salvation rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's a salvation rest. And when we yield ourselves to him, and when we learn of him, and when we obey him by faith, we enjoy submission rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest onto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The first rest, salvation rest. Folks, that's peace with God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Isn't that great? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Up to that point, we were enemies of God. We were haters of God. Romans chapter 5 tells us that. But now that we're justified by faith, God, or that justified means God sees us just as if we've never sinned and all the guilt and the shame and everything that goes with our sin has been dealt with on the cross. We're justified by faith through Jesus Christ. Not anything that you and I do, but it's through him. And because of that, we have peace with God. That's awesome. So many people in the world that, that don't have this peace with God. They still hate God. They don't want anything to do with God. They have no time for God, no regard for God. And that should break our hearts. And that should motivate us to be telling people about Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. We have peace with God. And this submission rest, the second is a peace 
of God. So we have peace with God and then peace of God. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any praise, and if there be any, or if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So when we are saved, we have peace with God. And when we submit to him and serve him and love him and obey him, we have the peace of God. But when we start to drift from God's word, and when we start to doubt God's word, we can lose the peace of God in our hearts and minds. But we can't lose the peace with God. We can't lose that. What a wonderful rest that is. It is by believing that we enter that rest. Verse 3 of Hebrews 4 for we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So it's by believing that we enter in this rest, and it's by obeying God by faith and surrendering him that, that his will his will that the rest enters us that we have this rest he is discussing salvation rest the rest of trusting Christ let me ask you a question I've got this down if you knew a man or a woman who professed to be a Christian and whom you really believed was a born-again believer, and they suddenly stopped living the Christian life and began acting like the world, if they stopped going to church, stopped giving to the Lord's work, stopped all their participation in Christ or Christian activities, would you think that they had lost their salvation? If you were that person, would you think that you have lost your salvation. If you think that this would cause you to lose your salvation, may I say to you that way back in the recesses of your mind and deep down in your heart, you are not really trusting Christ. That was a two by four moment. Or God just beat me over the head. I think it was J. Vernon McGee that wrote that, and he continued by saying, you are believing that these activities add to your salvation. But they don't. You and I are completely, we are to completely trust Christ. And then I add it. Don't misunderstand me. I believe that if we are trusting Christ, we are to be doing those things. Going to church, giving to the Lord's work, serving him and the such. But doing these things has nothing to do in the world with our salvation. We do these things because we love him and we love his people. Have we really entered into rest? Have we really entered into rest? Verse 5 and 6, it says, And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some 
must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. They don't have this rest because of unbelief. It's unbelief that robs a person of the rest of salvation. It's unbelief. What keeps a person from going to heaven? Is it because they're a murderer or a thief or a liar? It's because of unbelief. They do not put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's unbelief that robs a person of this rest. That robs a person of, of the rest of satisfaction and blessing which God can give to you. And that's a wonderful rest that he wants all of us to have. It's a wonderful rest that he wants all of us to enjoy. Verse 7, and I'll finish with verse 7. It says, again, he remaineth a certain day, saying in David, today, after a long or after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. He is not saying tomorrow. He's saying today. He's saying now. Today is the day for you and me. Today, right now, wherever you are, I want you to do something. And I'll never say this again when I'm preaching. Look at your watch. Look at your watch. If you don't have a watch, look at the clock. Look at your watch or look at their clock. Here's a question. What time is it? What's that? 11.58. Anybody else? What time is it? Come on, y'all just looked at your watches. Well, I know some of you are thinking it, but they're not saying it's time for you to land the plane. So what time is it? Here's what time it is. It's time of salvation. Now. It says today, which means now. Now. Right now. Where you are, right now, you can trust Christ if you've never trusted in him before. Now is the time. Now. And if you trust him right now, he will save you right now. There's no hoops to jump through. It's not a process. It's we cry out to him for salvation. Jesus I know I'm a sinner. The Bible tells me that. And even if the Bible didn't tell me that or someone didn't tell me that, I know I do wrong things. But I also heard that you went to the cross to die for me, to pay the punishment and penalty for my sin. And I know that it says, because I heard or I'm being told now, that if I come to you and put my faith and trust in you and what you have done, that you will save me. You will forgive me for my sin. You will abide in me. You will be with me to guide me and direct me. If I was to do that now, you would save me now. 
and I want to do that. And if we pray with a genuine heart, it's not the Lord's, or it's not the, the prayer that saves us. It's the genuine heart that is crying out to God. I need a Savior. And there's only one Savior. Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, no one at all, comes to the Father but by Him. So now, the time is to trust Him, if you haven't already. Today, if you hear His voice, pardon not Harden not your hearts. Believer, what time is it? It's time for us to start encouraging one another. It's time for us to provoke one another in love and good works. As we looked at last weekend when the Sealies were here, it's time to get to the task that is given to us telling people about Jesus. Because he's coming again. It's coming soon, I think. So we have lots of work to do. That's what time is for us. It's time for us to work. It's time for us to worship. It's time for us to witness. Father, again, we just thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for speaking to each and every one of us. And we thank you for the rest that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this rest is available to all. To all who call upon the name of the Lord. To all that will be saved. And Father, I pray this morning if there's someone here or someone listening online that does not know you, that today, right now would be the day of their salvation. And Lord, if there's someone here that, that wants to know what it means or how to trust in you, I pray they'd stay behind and talk to me or another Christian friend that they know, or if someone's online that they would send a comment or a message and we can get in touch with them. We're always more than happy to talk about spiritual things. And Father, for believers, it's time for us to encourage, to build up one another, to fellowship with one another, to love one another, and to work with each other. So Father, we know as we look in Sunday school that you are going to build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What a wonderful promise. What a wonderful joy it is to be in your church your people. So as we leave this place, may we meditate on what we have heard this morning and may we delight in your word. But may we also put all these things into practice. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing the last two verses of Trust and Obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and and obey. <clears throat> but we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows, for the joy he bestows, are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. 
says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you folks. Lord willing, we'll see you tonight.